Hello everyone, it's April 16th, 2019. It's Tuesday. It's Harp Tuesday. Welcome to this week's episode. And here I'm starting sort of a new sub-series called From the Harp Archives. And I got this idea a little bit from last episode where one of the things I did was draw attention to Hasselman's Petite Versus. And I thought it might be interesting to every once in a while do an episode where I, again, sort of draw your attention to a piece that is in the public domain that exists, in this case, I'm largely going to be drawn from the music that's available on the Harp Archives, which is um, the American Harp Society's collection of music that's been digitized and is on archive.org. So if you look at the video description down below, you'll see a link to that fantastic resource. And I'll often come across some music that looks interesting, but that I don't end up actually learning and performing myself. And so in this series, what I will do is, again, it's not a piece that I maybe learn myself, so I won't do an in-depth look at it, but I'll just kind of draw your attention to it, maybe read through a little bit of it. In this case, I, I'm gonna play through, kind of sight read through, talk about some things that, as they occur, and just draw your attention to it and maybe give you some helpful ideas or useful information if you decide to look at it yourself. So this first piece that I'm gonna look at is in a way it's it's kind of cheating because my idea would be to look at some maybe more obscure or, or pieces that you might not be aware of. In this case though it's uh, it's a setting of The Last Rose of Summer which is of course quite a famous well-known tune by Felix Godefroy, and again a famous well-known harpist. So it's not maybe obscure but you may or may not be aware that he did this lovely little four-page arrangement of The Last Rose of Summer and it's a piece, uh, again, I've, I've just, in preparation for this, I've read through it a few times. I've not played it. I have worked with it with one student on it. And um, it, the tune, The Last Rose of Summer, is actually very, it's a harp, harp tune. The, the, the words are by Thomas Moore. And then the tune, according to Wikipedia, um, comes from a harp melody that was collected by our old friend Edward Bunting. So it's, a, it's, this, it's this lovely melody, lovely song. I'm not actually that familiar with it. It's a, a famous name, um, but I'm not that familiar with it. So one of the things I did today, and again, something that you might do when you tackle a piece that you're not as familiar with, is I listened to some versions on YouTube of people singing it to get a, make sure I kind of had a reasonable understanding of the tune. Okay, so let's take a, let's take a look here. So I think there's a little bit of an intro. <laughs> For a moment so lovely little intro i would want to just make sure again that i'm doing the right rhythm this version that i'll link below that i'm looking working from i'm working from my ipad so it's a little bit small and uh, i just want to make sure that okay nine eight we got these three big beats right essentially three four with three sets of triplets um making sure that i'm so for example here in the second bar on this version at least the way it's typeset is a little bit peculiar because this first chord is worth three eighth notes. The second chord is one eighth note and then two eighth notes rest, but the space that it takes up is much larger than the first chord. And so there's a thought that maybe this one is longer. What is it? So, so you know, just one of those things to be aware of in terms of reading through something for the first time or for the first few times um, that those... So, is I if I were to work on this I would figure out do, how many of these chords how, how much do I want to roll them on the faster chord there that last eighth note beat of the first bar I didn't do much of a roll 
And of course here, this, this two note chord and two note chord in each both hands, maybe not a huge break on either of those. It looks like as if he has marked in this edition at least some spots specifically to be broken, but again, that doesn't mean that we can't break others. Then we get this lovely little... fewer than that. So again, a great spot to think about patterns when you realize this is all just a G arpeggio where the right hand is, is playing something and the left hand is playing um, the bottom two notes, right? So if we have this first inversion four note G chord, we're playing the bottom two notes in the left hand, moving up one inversion, and of course being aware of, okay, checking in with the rhythm, it's one two and three and one and two and three and one that the downbeat is that second left hand note so that we don't hear one and two and three and one that we don't let the fourth finger in the right hand become the downbeat um so sorry we'll do a little bit of that it through earlier I might just repeat that D because because the left hand just played it and it's actually a little bit annoying to play it again with the right hand but if we play it again with the left hand I think it's much cleaner or much bit less there's much less of a chance of buzzing there um, Again, I might be tempted to take this C in the left hand just because I can. Again, kind of being aware, okay, so as marked here, one, two, three, one, two, three, oh, sorry, one, two, yes, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, uh, yes, one, two, three, one, uh, looks, from the voicing, it looks as if, this note, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, one, is the tune. And again, this is where the more familiar you are with, say, the most typical version, which is a sung version, you might start to to, to, to say, oh yes, okay, I want to bring this out. This is part of the tune. Um, and again, we get then we get this little pattern. Uh, is that right? No. beautiful um, harmonics in the tune with a little single note accompaniment which can be just so effective very sparse very clean and beautiful uh, sorry. Uh, my, my finger is a little sketchy here because I'm, I'm more in the mode of sight reading again if I were to work on that I'd try to make sure that I have a fingering that I'm really happy with maybe mark some of these pedal changes in. Sorry. Pretty sure these are right-hand harmonics as well. Even though in this edition, they're not marked, they are uh, in the lower line, the same phrase. So this is, yeah, one, two, three, four, five, six, suggestion is to play this chord and again you can download the sheet music below so follow along I don't think I'm gonna have it up on screen while this is going on but uh, you can you can always just follow along uh, yourself either print it out put it on a tablet or something like that um, so it's written it would appear that he's suggesting we go four three two one two one but from my point of view I would rather go do three two one just as I've just played that chord with three two one and three, two, one, the left hand. So, uh, whatever it is. Great. Uh, sorry, what is this?
notice this again when I played earlier. This is clearly, clearly I, 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 that is, should be a D flat. They don't need to mark that specifically as D flat because our D natural has been up here, different octave. But you might want to put a reminder in for yourself, or and or definitely a pedal change there, just because we, otherwise we might miss it. Um, though we'll probably hear it if we if we missed it. It's interesting because they put a reminder in here. is a great key for the pedal harp because it's almost all open strings just the one natural and everything else is that the longest length it can be gives us the best resonance we can possibly get i should mention that i'm always on the lookout for pieces that can be adapted to the lever harp i didn't but the student that i worked with on this she plays both pedal and lever harp and she adapted this for the lever harp and it worked fairly well and of course we just played in the key of g then on lever harp but because we're in the key of G-flat, we can hear on this little arpeggio use an F-sharp to double the G-flat sound. So it's like a root position, seventh chord shape. And as a general rule, I would always suggest if you're doing something like that, on the very last one, even though it sort of pattern and fingering wise is tempting to keep that same seventh chord shape we've been doing, I would always play the actual open string note rather than the sharp, especially on these smaller strings. It can be more chance the regulation might not be perfect, and this way we get to have an open string, so something I would definitely do there. If you were playing this on the lever harp and didn't have the ability to double that, you could potentially do something like, oh, sorry, not starting with the right hand, I guess. Just do a more spread out G arpeggio, or you could try to place quite light. And try not to have that G sound stopped. I'd probably be more inclined to just, just do a nice G arpeggio without any repeated notes. Um, okay, let's keep going. Ah, so then, yes, a little bit more intensity, and we, and we suddenly we have all the eighth note beats in the left hand. I would probably, at the moment, feel as if I'd like to play this and jump off. Of course, you could do four, maybe cross under, maybe cross over if you want to try and connect the whole thing, but I'd be pretty happy just jumping off, I think. I'm sorry. as well.
interesting. into this. If we're going to play the chord solid, that's no problem. If we want to roll that chord, I'd almost be tempted to roll that chord with an E, sort of start the grace notes on the beat. Anyway, something to play. I would definitely be playing around with that. Definitely need a reminder there to change that D back to flat. Um, on those bottom two notes, I'll just do the top one and play the chord. Aha! Uh -huh. That's something that I actually should practice more, and that's trying to do, play the top harmonic and roll. Or something Godefroy likes to, likes to do this. He's written that in them. Certainly in the etude, the E minor, E flat minor etude. Something I should I should probably practice. Sorry. note um, as loud as I wanted. Again, he's got this fortissimo ending. I like the build up this this at the end. I don't know about the allegro, but this this this. We, we kind of think we're fading away, right? Um, with all these fading, fading, and then. Something like that. Anyway, that's how it sounds to me. Yeah, this needs to be replaced. Um, that's how it sounds to me at the moment. But again, that'll be something I would experiment with. So, anyway, there it is. It's a lovely, lovely setting, I think, of a beautiful piece. And hopefully you might be interested and inspired to take a look at it. Or to browse through yourself. Browse through the Harp archives. And, and more and more as libraries start to digitize their collections, 
we have access, easy access all over the world to a lot of public domain harp music and it's a fantastic resource. So um, hope you like this and I definitely plan to do some future episodes looking at, as I say, from the harp archives. So hope you enjoyed that. See you in a week, uh, two weeks time. Cheers. <laughs>